Dan, Dan Seaman, to speak. Uh, he's the director of the Government Press Office. Certainly when we're in this asymmetric battle that we're facing at the moment, when we, as was mentioned here, are uh, a state with the military, etc., facing combatants, non-statehood uh, uh, organizations, or terrorist organizations, let's put it clearly, I don't care if they were elected or not, they're terrorists. They direct their attacks on civilians, it's terrorism. And in this sense, the army should conduct itself, as I said, concentrate on the military objectives. Part of the military objectives is also that the military objectives are not interfered and disrupted by the presence of media. And this was the first thing that the IDF did. I think that if you compare it to three and a half, uh, two and a half years ago with the war in Lebanon, media access does not mean anarchy. And media should not be running around between the legs of the military troops. They should not be reporting, and for only the simple reason that we do not have to assist the enemy in knowing what our troop movements are and where our troops are going. The last thing I wanted as a paratrooper in the IDF was to have the media there telling them exactly where we're going at what time we're leaving out there. I think the element of surprise requires it not having media around. But maybe it's just me, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, and here I have to take hats off to Avi Bnayao, the IDF spokesperson, and the wonderful job that he did. A person who comes from the media, understands media, and knows how to handle it in that sense. You should not allow media, you know, as I said, a democratic country, there are also rules and regulations that also the media have to abide by. The media cannot violate the laws in a democratic country. So, in this case, the fact of a closed military area, allowing embeds, which was a brilliant concept uh, prevented by the United States back in the first Gulf War. And the concept of media embedding is not only to give access to the media, it's also part of the other aspect that we have, in this sense, is getting people to the identification, the knowledge of who you're dealing with. Because otherwise, media are reporting on these nameless and faceless soldiers who are bloodthirsty thugs who are trying to kill and murder and who knows what else and what else they're accused of doing. The embed lets them sit around with Billy Bob and with Jane and have break bread with them and sleep with them and get to know that these are my neighbors, my friends, they could be my brother and my sister. And you look at what their, their actions and you understand from that by being with them you get this recognition and you understand these are not these bloodthirsty uh, guns for hire, but average, especially in the case of Israel, the average Israeli citizen who was called upon to put down his pen, to put down his books, to put down their everyday lives, to leave their families the third time in six years and go and defend the population. So the embed is brilliant in that sense. It gives you access to the media, at the same time an understanding and an identification with your side of the story. The second element was that the government conducts the media campaign, in that sense both the public relations and the information aspect of it. You have civilians standing there. Because in the war in Lebanon what you had were only civilians on the other side, and even with Hezbollah, all in, in civilian uniform, taking journalists around, showing them only civilians, and therefore, they're only civ we only saw civilians killed, was the report of many of the media. We didn't see the combatants that the Israelis are talking about. Very similar to what's happening now in Gaza. Where are all these combatants you're talking about? We only see civilians killed. Now that's another point that I'll address in a moment. The fact of the matter here is that when you are conducting a, a, a battle against people who are manipulating the media and using sim, uh, civilian symbolism to affect the public opinion internationally, you can't have military people there. You can't have only pictures of uh, military tanks going around, though they may be very dramatic and they're good television for the television people, they don't serve the interests of your country. Because the story is the fact that for seven and a half years, our civilian population in Zderot, for three and a half years in Ashkelon, have been suffering the onslaught of rockets. And those who say that this is not terrorism, I, don't, I know one thing. That my children, if my six-year-old is assaulted at gunpoint, well, we can call the police, we can beat them off, that's why I carry a gun. I can use my pistol. But when somebody's shooting a rocket at my mother who lives in Ashkelon, how am I supposed to respond to that? Call the police? The police are hiding also. I was there in Ashkelon, anytime there's a siren, people, the police are running for shelter. And this is the issue that we have to deal with, address this issue, let the people, first off, the civilian representatives be on, appear on the media, and second, get the people out there. 
Now, contrary to a lot of what's being said, there was no policy of barring the media from the Gaza Strip. I don't care what Haaretz newspaper says. That's why I don't read them. But the point of the matter is that the government did not have a policy of barring the media from Gaza. The question is, why weren't the media there in the first place? Why weren't they there? We didn't pull them out. There was a representative there from Al Jazeera. The fact of the matter is that the media were not there because they fled the Gaza Strip. Why did they flee the Gaza Strip? Because there were threats against them by Hamas. Not only the famous abduction of Alan Johnson of the BBC. There were daily threats against them. There was a purging of all non-Hamas members who are the stringers for the foreign press in Gaza. Anybody working with the foreign press in Gaza today is affiliated in one way or another with Hamas. So I get this from the foreign press. What, you're saying that they're all terrorists? No. But they are and they listen. And believe me, very attentively, they listen to what Hamas tells them to do. So when you have journalists walking around Gaza Strip and saying, I was never approached by anybody from Hamas, the people spoke to me. This refers to a very fundamental problem that we have, the state of Israel, and the media has with what is going on in this conflict. They don't have the fundamental understanding of what we're dealing with. Because if for seven and a half years the media didn't constantly cover with the intensity that they cover the Gaza situation, they did not cover what happened here in Israel. And I was at a conference in Eilat two months ago, exactly two months ago, for the Israel Journalists Association. I was on a panel with the foreign press. And we spoke about the fact, this was before the war broke out. And we spoke about the fact that they are not covering the events in the south of Israel. They said it's not photogenic, unfortunately. It's not photogenic. It's a part of the problem we have. Terrorism, unless you have some horrible, blood, bloody incident, you don't have good images. And what we're talking about here is not journalism. We're talking about television. Television dictates the agenda for the rest of the journalists. If you have a good bloody scene and, be, and, journal, and excuse me, television deals with blood, sweat and tears, drama, scandal, they need, they, they're, it's a very dramatic medium. And they set the tone. Because if a, if a correspondent is going to write something that is not what they saw on television the night before, the editor is going to say to them, wait a minute, this is not what I saw on television last night. What I saw was the UNRWA school. Why are you not reporting that? Now here comes to the issue of not letting the journalists in and why, despite the fact that there was not a policy, I was not shy about the fact that I was very happy with the fact that the journalists were not there. Not because we're not a democratic country and we're opposed to freedom of the press, etc., etc., all these other things that Israel was accused of. Because the simple fact that we're not talking about journalism, we're talking about television. And the UNRWA school was good television, good dramatic pictures. And you think, I said this before, that the first casualty of war is the truth. Well, the second casualty of war is good journalism. Because the journalists are not verifying, they're not checking their sources, they're in a feeding frenzy. They want to get the angle. They want to, they want to outcompete and outshoot in that sense of getting the better dramatic picture than their competition. It's a 24-hour news cycle. They have to get new news, they have to get things that other people hadn't seen. You think you're going to wait around for the Israeli explanation? And the Palestinians are experts at manipulating the images for television. They've had 30 years of preparation for this by being employed by the foreign press and producing, mass producing, of pictures and images that they see sell. Because what the editor, pitch photograph editor abroad wants is a good picture that's going to sell papers. The good image is going to be impressed on the minds of the, of the public who's viewing this. And this works to the detriment of Israel. Because when they start dragging in the bodies, where do these bodies come from? Are they taking them out through the back and bringing them in through the front? Nobody sees that. Nobody tells you that. Who was shooting from there? And this goes to the fundamental aspect I was talking to you before. They don't understand the concepts of modern warfare, of guerrilla warfare. You know, they're always quick to, when you say terrorists, to say militants, extremists, guerrillas. But when they're conducting guerrilla warfare, par excellence, par mautzitun, in Gaza, none of them understand what they're seeing. They don't understand, and they, by the way, we had a briefing for the IDF with uh, the Israel Project in Ashkelon, in which we described to them how the tactics of the Hamas are in Gaza. There were over, there were over 800 journalists employ, employed in Israel, foreign media, 400 arrived for the war, 30 showed up at the briefing. 30 showed up for the briefing. Now in that briefing we explained to them that the Hamas uses homes and where they place equipment and how they use and what their tactics are. And even a person who's sitting there, first off, the, the, the Gazans have no choice in the matter. 
They're told that we're going to have somebody shooting from this building. They're not even not told. Somebody knocks, breaks down the door, comes in, shoots from the building. Because that's the instructions they got from the Hamas leadership. Use the civilian areas. So when you have pictures of devastation, when you have stories, horrible stories told by Palestinians, I'm not even talking about the exaggeration yet. Yes, but none of the media think to ask the simple question. Why was this house chosen and not the next? Why is there devastation in these, this location and not random dem uh, des uh, destruction? They're not qualified to ask these questions. They don't understand the warfare. I had 400 people in the first week show up, all of them wanting to go into the Gaza Strip. Do they know the history? Do they understand the background? No. They need to go in there to get good images. What about our side? What about the civilians on our side? It's irrelevant. What they told me there, and the, I'm going back to the conference in Eilat, was that these images, they're not that dramatic. We told the story once. I said, well, what about the disruption of life? This is sheer terrorism. Terrorism is not only in body count. It's all how life has been disrupted. You're not telling that story. It's no way to tell that drama. I believe I see constantly hundreds of stories annually about the disruption of Palestinian life due to the roadblocks that Palestinians have to go through due to the wall that they have to suffer for, which raises another issue. If we take military action, we're horrible. If we do nothing and only use defensive measures such as roadblocks, we're horrible. If we put up a wall, we're horrible. We cannot fight, defend ourselves. There is nothing we can basically do to have some people in the international media except Israel. Taking any measure of self-defense is unacceptable in their eyes. And um, does that mean that we're not to take uh, measures of self-defense? <laughs> the point is here is that we're in some time, and this is what I, the positive thing I took out of the media uh, campaign in this current conflict was that we're no longer trying to appease people on the other side. We're not trying to give the nice message. Sometimes we have to tell them the bitter truth. Sometimes the truth is hard. It is painful. We shouldn't shy away from it. They can either accept it or they can't. But the most important thing is doing what is right for the people of Israel. And that's what the government of Israel and the state of Israel has done now. Let's hope it will continue with that. I could go on explaining more of the problems of the media and why in that sense. Because one point I have to make here, and this is how it ties into the issue of the legal aspects that was touched upon a little. All these legal issues were not brought up by international organizations because they were physically on location. They were not. It was brought up by the media. Now first by the media that was there, the affiliates, Palestinian affiliates of Reuters, Al Jazeera, uh, were physically there, AP, etc. And now, the hundreds of stories coming out from the journalists since they've entered the Gaza Strip. Only in 3% of the cases, we had over 150 journalists in the Gaza Strip in the past week. Three cases they called up to ask the IDF for an explanation on the stories they got. Stories of us running over children with tanks. Stories of jo Sophie's Choice started to stories of uh, a Palestinian woman saying that I had ten children. They, the IDF came and asked me to choose five who they will uh, sacrifice for the state of Israel. There's a purpose here. The purpose is not only the strategic requirement of a terrorist group to reach parity on the strategic level with the state of Israel. That this is what they're doing to, to a large degree. They're going beyond that now. The strategic value here is to delegitimize the state of Israel. To legitimize any uh, source of opposition to Israel's existence. Not only through terrorism, but also perhaps even if we are a Nazi. And you look at the fact that the Nazi terminology is applied very freely to the state of Israel. You don't hear anybody in the foreign press speaking about Hamas in terms of Taliban, etc. But Israel is also always associated with Nazi terminology in order to create a delegitimization of the Jewish right to self-determination and therefore any attempt to annihilate the state of Israel receives legitimacy. And this is the threat that we're facing at the moment. These efforts that the media, sometimes I would say uh, unintentionally, play to because of not doing their job as journalists, not verifying the sources, in this case they are helping these efforts to delegitimize the state of Israel and the constant existential threat against the state of Israel because they see they can get away with it. This was said earlier in a panel today. The fact that not only we let them get away with it, so do the people in the international media. And this is what we have to fight against. Now we can also take legal actions. If somebody defames the state of Israel for too long, we've allowed them to get away without prosecution. But more than that, 
and the manipulation of images. I'm not talking about opinions or even television angles or um, uh, picture angles. And the manipulation of the image, anything that is, ma uh, is artificially manufactured, photoshopping, staged, like the Aldora case, anything like this is fraud. And this should be addressed through the laws, the criminal laws pertaining to fraud. There's not, we don't have to invent new laws about this. Anybody trying to deceive the public, it's considered fraud, can be challenged, can be prosecuted. This is where Israel should be going on that. When the media, when the photo editor of a major media organization allows a photo to go through, which he or any person at home, any blogger, and it usually comes from the bloggers, can clearly identify it as artificially, uh, artificially manufactured, they should understand that there's going to be legal action taken against them. Because if they don't do their job as journalists, I'm sure the accountant in their office will tell them, look, you better verify your source, because this is going to cost us. And money talks in the international media. One last point I would like to make, unless I'm going to make this in Hebrew, um, and you'll understand why. Um, this is, pertains to the, the effect of, of Israel trying to, well, the defense of commanders in the IDF. Me'od lo noachli im ha'ovda azot shechaylei tzal, k'tzinei tzal, צריכים להסתיר את הפרצופים שלהם. חיילים יהודים ש-70 שנה אחרי השואה, 60 שנה מאז הקמת מדינת ישראל, מגינים על ילדים יהודים, לא צריכים להסתיר את הפרצוף שלהם. ואם המחיר הוא לא לנסוע לאנגליה, לא לנסוע לבלגיה, שלא ניסע לאנגליה ולבלגיה. אני בשירותי בצבאי, כצנחן, מעולם לא עשיתי דבר שפגע לא רק במוסר שלי, אלא במוסר היהודי, שעליו חונכתי וגדלתי, ועל המוסר של צה"ל. החינוך היהודי